Cryptid Hunters, Chapter 22, Rose Noah Blackwood slept very little and was up before dawn, pacing the polished aisles of his dioramas in an absolute rage. He no longer cared that Wolf was the best cryptid hunter in the world. We don't need him to lead us to cryptids, he told Natasha. We can find them on our own. Dr. Travis Wolf is going to disappear. I should have taken care of him years ago. Butch slept in. When he finally opened his eyes, he did not get out of his hammock and, ro and rouse his men with the tip of his boot as usual. Instead, he lazily opened the little computer and checked on the girl and boy, smiling with satisfaction when he saw their blue and gray tags in the same spot as the night before. Next, he checked on Wolf and Dr. Lee. Their turquoise and yellow tags were moving, and he was surprised to see the route they were taking. It wasn't the most direct route, but they were making remarkable progress just the same. He sat up and swung his long legs out of the hammock and pressed the vid cam, which had been inactive the night before. The picture swooped through the trees at a dizzying speed, then suddenly stopped directly above a man and a woman. The man looked up, and Butch saw his sweating, bearded face. Wolf had gained a little weight, and the beard was new, but there was no mistaking the intense eyes. Wolf was hunting. But when you get here, Butch thought, your quarry will be gone. You won't beat me this time. He smiled at the thought and checked Marty's email. Subject important from wolf at ewolf.com to marty at ewolf.com. Marty, I forgot to tell you what to do with the ladder. You need to pull it up into the tree behind you. If you leave it against the trunk, it will be a dead giveaway for Butch McCall. Also, you might want to check the clearing. Make sure you didn't leave anything around. After that, go up, back up to the Sky House and wait until we get there. I can't emph emphasize this enough. I don't care how bored you get. Stay in the Sky House. Love, Wolf. I promise, Butch said. He touched the bow cam. The boy was up. He was cooking breakfast. Marty was trying to cook breakfast, which was not easy with the primitive appliances and limited ingredients. His machete arm was so sore he could barely he was barely able to whisk the packet of freeze-dried eggs he was preparing. Grace was still asleep on the two chairs with her moleskin and monkey. Petey was buried somewhere under her blanket. He suspected that she had been up most of the night because the kerosene lantern was still lit and her pen was still in her hand. A sniff and taste of the spices revealed that they had lost their pep and wouldn't do the eggs much good. What I need is... Bo was fooling around with something on the floor. Marty slapped her hand and took the snake head away from her. There are venom snacks in that head, he lectured. If you had a cut in your mouth and bit into it, that would be the last snack you ever ate. He carefully dropped the head into a salt jar to preserve it, thinking it would make a nice souvenir for Luther. He felt a slight breeze hit his face and heard the toilet whistle. He turned and saw where the breeze was coming from. There was a broken window and a torn screen above the laboratory bench. Bat hole, he speculated. They must have stayed inside last night because of the storm. I'll board it up tonight after they leave. Where was I? Oh yeah, the eggs. He found what he was looking for, the six-foot-long green mamba body. He gave it a sniff. It smelled a little odd, but not tainted. He sliced off a steak with his machete and tossed the rest of the body through the trap door. Twenty minutes later, he was finished with his breakfast masterpiece, which he called Green Eggs and Mamba. Grace felt someone or something shaking her awake. She opened her eyes in alarm, then breathed a sigh of relief when she saw it was Marty. It had been a revealing but terrifying night. Her brother was holding a plate of food. In the center of the plate was a blue orchid, the same color as her eyes. It's beautiful, she said. The food or the flower? Both, the whole presentation. She put the orchid in her hair. Look outside. Grace looked through the window over the bench and smiled at the kaleidoscope of colorful orchids. If you discount the furry ceiling decorations, Marty said, which I'll take care of tonight, this place isn't half bad. Despite her weariness, Grace had to agree. With the morning sun streaming through the windows, the sky house looked homey, cheerful, and... I still can't get over how familiar it all seems, she said. That's because it looks like the house on Kryptos, Marty said. I mean, if you've seen Wolf's house on the island, you would know that this was his place. You're probably right, Grace said. But she felt like there was more to it than that. What did you make for breakfast? It smells good. Eggs and, uh, Marty hesitated. Chicken. 
He didn't want to prejudice her taste buds before she gave it a try. Where did you get the chicken? Wolf had a few cans in the canister, Marty lied. They were in the bottom of your pack. So that's why it was so heavy. I guess. You better eat before it cools off. Grace took a bite. The chicken tastes a bit odd. That's the spices, Marty explained. They're pretty old and some of them have lost their flavor. He was looking forward to telling her the truth some day. How'd you sleep? Not very well. The nightmare? Grace nodded. She wanted to tell him more, but she was reluctant to do so until she knew more herself. For the first time, she had remembered some of the dream. I don't suppose you want to hike over to the lake to pick up the pack with me, Marty said. I'm pretty tired, Grace said. My legs are sore from last night. Maybe I should stay here and clean up. This place is a mess. This place did need some cleaning, but it wasn't like Grace to offer to do it. Not that Marty was much of a housekeeper either. I guess that would be okay, he said. But you have to promise me something. What? Marty shook his head. First the promise. All right, I promise. She squeezed Monkey's arm. You have to stay right here until I get back. No wandering off. Agreed, but I may go down to the pond to take a bath a little, a bit later. That hardly seemed necessary to Marty, considering the drenching they've received the night before. As long as you stay in the clearing. Okay. Marty slipped his sneakers on and strapped the machete around his waist. See you later. Bo followed him out through the trap door. As soon as they left, she retrieved her moleskin and found the section where she had recounted what she remembered of the nightmare. I'm sitting by a pond surrounded by impossibly tall trees with a symphony of animal sounds coming from them. It's hot and damp, the air thick and still. I'm happy. Monkey is with me. Its arm is torn but still attached. There are people around me, but I can't see their faces. They are laughing, enjoying themselves, and I'm the center of their attention. But something happens. A voice calls from the woods. People scrambling around, shouting, grabbing things. Monkey's arm is torn off as I'm picked up. I cry. We'll fix it later, a woman says. Don't cry. We'll fix it later. We're running through the trees. I'm still crying. I want Monkey. We stop. Quiet, honey, quiet. We'll get Monkey later. I'm put on the ground near the base of a tree. There's a bright flash of light, a terrified scream, deafening explosion. A man yells in agony. The sound breaks my heart. More explosions. Then, that's all she remembered. But it was a start. She sat on the sofa with her eyes closed, her pen poised above her moleskin, hoping to remember more. But nothing came. The sound of breaking glass shattered her concentration. Startled, she looked over at the laboratory bench. The parrot was back. It had squeezed through the torn screen and knocked over a beaker. Petey ran over to the bench and started yipping and jumping in an effort to reach the gray bird. I'm not going to put up with this all day, Gray said, getting up. The bird flew over to the ladder leading up to the second floor and began tapping on the trap door. Grace climbed the short ladder and pushed the door open. The bird flew through the opening. She debated whether to follow or to shut the door, trapping the parent up, parrot upstairs so that she can have some peace and quiet. But her curiosity pushed her head through the opening. In the center of the room was a queen-sized bed, unmade, as if the occupant had gotten up just that morning. On the floor next to the bed was a crumbled pair of pants and a pair of boots that were definitely too small for her uncle. Laurel had been to the Sky House with Mausolito, she remembered. They must belong to her. But why would she leave them behind? She climbed the rest of the way up. The parrot hopped over to the door and tapped on it with its black beak. Grace opened the door and found a closet filled with women's clothes and shoes, including a beautiful red dress made of fine silk. This does not belong to Dr. Laurel Lee, Grace thought. Not her style. Who had been with her uncle? As she turned to leave, she saw an old trunk and several storage bo boxes pushed to the back beneath the clothes. She pulled the trunk out. Painted on the lid was a faded red rose. Grace's heart started pounding. She glanced over at the parrot. It had gone uncharacteristically quiet and was looking at her expectantly. She started to open the lid. Rose is back, the parrot said. Grace slammed the lid shut and stared at the parrot in shock. What did you say? Rose is back, the parrot repeated clearly, then hopped over to a second door and started tapping on it. Grace put her hand on the doorknob, but hesitated to turn it. 
She knew that on the other side lay something disturbing, something she wasn't quite sure she was ready to see. Maybe the door was locked, but it wasn't. The knob turned easily. She closed her eyes and pushed the door open. When she opened her eyes, her knees buckled, and she grabbed the door jam to stop herself from falling. It did no good. Her head hit the floor with a dull thud, and everything went dark. At first, Butch McCall thought the girl was dead, and if she was, he was dead too. Blackwood would make sure of that. She was slumped in a doorway on the second floor. He turned her over, felt her neck for a pulse, and breathed a sigh of relief when he felt blood pumping through the artery. There was an ugly bruise on her forehead. One of his men came in holding his left hand and reported that the sky house was empty except for a crazy little dog which had bitten him. Butch suspected as much. The pocket computer had shown the boy moving toward Lake Tully in a rather roundabout way, probably to retrieve his pack, Butch thought. He'll be disappointed when he gets there. What did you do with the dog? he asked in French. I put her in the toilet room, the man answered, looking at the girl. What's the matter with her? Bumped her head. The man laughed. I didn't hit her on the head, Butch said. She must have fallen. The man didn't look as though he believed him. Butch threw Grace over his shoulder and climbed down to the lower floor. He lay her on the sofa, then surveyed the room. He found what looked like a diary and a stuffed animal that resembled a monkey. He put them into a little pack she had been carrying the day before and gave it to one of the men. He wanted to make it look like she had gone out for a walk, but this time she isn't coming back, Butch thought. The poodle was barking and scratching at the door. He let her out and she immediately went for the man she had bitten. The man backed up to the wall like a lion was chasing him and pulled out his machete. No! Butch shouted. Leave it alone. Reluctantly, the man put the machete back in the scabbard and tried to shake P.D. off his pant leg. Butch went over to Grace, tore the tag from her neck, and kicked it under the sofa. Let's go.